Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. And now we are back from the break. And now we are going to begin with Mariana's Canto session. Uh, first of all, I'm going to just uh, mention that uh, the U.S. Observatory has a code of conduct and we do not tolerate any harassment. So in case you have experienced any harassment uh, behavior, please send us an email and we will reply. Now I'm going to pass uh, the floor for Mariana and their team. So please, uh, you all welcome. Hi, Eileen. I think I would not have access to the video. Okay. Uh, well, what about now? Not yet. I have now. I don't know if Gustavo and Joao and Barbara and Anna has. No, I can't. No. Just one second. Yes, now it works. <laughs> so can I start? Yes. Okay, hi everyone. Good afternoon from Brazil. I'm Ana Barbara. I work as a researcher at the Institute for Research on Internet and Society. And I'm here to conduct our conversation about digitalizing Brazilian democracy with transparency and responsibility. We have been passing through hard times during the pandemic and all these situations made us adapt ourselves and our lives in an unimaginable way in the last month. In this context, the internet became more than ever an indispensable tool for the exercise of citizenship. At a time when social isolation is required, it allows people to access public service, information, entertainment, work, and to solve their problems from home. It has been appropriated by people, but also by the public sector, which depends on the internet to carry out its process. For that matter, concerns about making the digital environment a safe and functional space are increasing in the public debate. In Brazil, the debate is fraught far from a consensus. We have bills in the public, public, public debate that leads us to a scenario of several doubts and questions. How, how to strengthen democracy using the internet? How to ensure trust and security on platforms focusing on service, essential service? What strategies have been taken by the legislative and judiciary powers in the country what are the risks of digitalization process that does not ensure care for information security? Well, we are here to discuss this scenario, what has been done, how the internet has been used to face the pandemic, to know the experiences of digital democracy, its potentialities and limitations. I'm glad to host this panel and happy to have you here to share with us your studies and experiences as young people engaged in internet governance. I'm sure that together we can together we can build and share nice discussions and pretty fruitful ideas. While the panelists are speaking, please feel comfortable writing down your questions in the chat and in the end we will have time to discuss it and answer them. First, I would like to invite our colleagues to speak. Each one of them has 10 minutes to do your speech. And after this, we are open to the debate. So now I give the floor to Gustavo and good afternoon, Gustavo. 
Hi, can everyone hear me well? Yes. Great. So first of all, thank you, Anna, uh, for the great intro introduction. I'm going to start by introducing myself. My name is Gustavo Rodriguez, and I am a policy coordinator at IRIS, the Institute for Research on Internet and Society, where Anna works as well. IRIS is an independent internet and society research center that has existed since 2015 and is based in Belo Horizonte. And our work includes research and education in topics such as privacy and data protection, digital inclusion, encryption policies, platform governance, and others. Well, so the theme that we're here today to discuss is the digitalization of Brazilian democracy. And given that I'm here representing civil society, I'd like to start the conversation by talking a little about how our institutions have been facing the issue during the pandemic and some of the concerns that have been raised by civil society in this process. And I think the first thing we need to understand is that unlike some other countries, and I'm thinking here of Ireland and Sweden, for instance, which have been much slower and perhaps more cautious in moving most institutional activity online, Brazil embraced digitalization fiercely during the pandemic. So since March, Congress has been adopting what is known here as the remote deliberation system, which is basically a platform that allows for audiovisual communication with up to 600 people. And uh, it can be accessed through both computers and mobile devices and is mainly used for public debates. Coupled with an application called InfoLag, this is the platform that is being used to conduct debates and voting during the pandemic. Um, the adoption of the remote deliberation system has been surrounded with, uh, I think we can say, a lot of enthusiasm regarding its potential for enabling parliamentary activity to be carried on remotely. But there are a number of significant concerns related to the impacts of this change, specifically in terms of accountability and transparency, which are core democratic values. So the first big issue is that the implementation of these tools did not foresee any instruments to ensure social participation, which was severely harmed by the suspension of face-to-face -face, uh, communication and activities in Congress. So this left us with only a few electronic tools that were already available before the pandemic. And those instruments were needed embedded in the remote systems and uh, the remote deliberation system, nor uh, they were covered by the norms that established that those systems would be used to ensure uh, adequate integration. So as I'm sure you all can imagine, we were, we were left with a precarious environment for public debates during the past few months as a result of that. And as a reaction to that, several civil society entities published a manifesto calling for measures to ensure transparency and public participation during the pandemic. Some of those demands that were, uh, this, uh, that were stated in the manifesto were that, for instance, only issues uh, related directly to fighting the coronavirus were voted by Congress, that uh, civil society was guaranteed a voice in the development of the tools used for voting and debating, also that uh, we could have uh, virtual public hearings on the topics that were being discussed. Uh, this would be a manner to provide some interaction between members of parliament and stakeholders in order to make up for the fact that uh, the usual channels for dialogue between stakeholders and especially civil society and members of parliament are not uh, available at this time. So, uh, this was what was demanded, but unfortunately, uh, we have yet to see those demands being consistently met and fulfilled. And I want to really make sure that we all understand how these concerns are not abstract. They are very concrete. So I think I can give an example to, uh, of how this hurried digitalization, this very fast digitalization, can harm public discussion on crucial matters. 
the example that I'm going to give is about the notorious fake news bill, which is a proposal that the Brazilian Congress has been discussing, has been discussing, and is allegedly aimed at fighting disinformation. The content of this bill has been wildly criticized uh, by experts and by civil society uh, stakeholders for having big risks to privacy and freedom of speech, but I'm not going to get into that uh, with detail right now because I want to focus on another point of criticism that was surrounding this proposal. And it was that there was an immense lack of debate about the project. Uh, both Iris, uh, which I represent, and Iperec, which Mariana represents here, uh, wrote technical papers pointing out these problems, including the lack of participation. And I think it's safe to say that our considerations on that regard were largely ignored. Besides a few live transmissions, which happened mainly because civil society took the initiative to really discuss the bill, the main tool that we had to make our voice heard was a platform called Wikileges, which does not allow for wide de debate, only for comments on very specific parts of the bill's text. And the tool is still in its beta version. So it's absolutely not adequate for the context and for discussing such a delicate uh, matter. And despite uh, protests of activists and scholars, the bill was passed in Senate and is now being discussed in the Chamber of Deputies. This is uh, perhaps a general comment on some of the difficulties that we have been facing regarding decision-making and digitalization during the pandemic in the country. So in summation, my take would be that while Brazil has been through a quick process of digitalization that enabled the country to act fast against the coronavirus, uh, we have uh, the process lacked the proper and sufficient mechanisms to preserve democratic values, such as transparency and participation. Uh, but there is also another dimension of digitalization, which I want to talk about because it requires some equally important considerations. And it is the relationship between information security and democracy in the context of so much sensitive information being transmitted through digital channels, especially in the public sector. This massive online migration shows uh, more than ever how democracy depends on an adequate environment in terms of both access to strong encryption and the political culture that values information security. But we still have a long way to go in those regards. So concerning encryption, for instance, uh, the country has been dealing with repeated attempts to weaken it both by the judiciary power and in Congress. And despite those attempts having not yet succeeded, they show how we still need to work very hard to make policymakers aware of how crucial encryption and, uh, uh, of course, information security in general is to democracy, even to their own activities. So uh, the coalition Direitos na Rede, which is comprised of several organizations that fight for digital rights, and uh, including IRIS and IPREC, uh, has recently put forth the Crypto August campaign, which was a decentralized initiative to encourage actions to bring awareness on the importance of, the, of encryption. And uh, uh, Iris and Iperac uh, participated in the campaign, producing educational material about the, the topic. I think maybe Mariana can talk a little bit more about that later. And uh, with regards to the importance of a uh, political culture that values information security, I think I can illustrate some of the challenges that we have to overcome with another example. Uh, last year, Brazil had a notorious security incident that caused several current and former public authorities to have their private messages leaked. Uh, this uh, is the episode known as Vaza Jato. And what was interesting about the case is that the situation was caused by their Telegram accounts, the Telegram accounts of several authorities uh, being hacked by a technique that could easily be prevented with two-factor authentication. 
but those authorities simply didn't have it on. And while the controversy did bring up some discussion on information security, the discourse that arose focused much more on punishing the hacker and criminalizing anonymity and hacking practices than uh, on what I think should be the focus, which is the systemic weakness of some platforms and the lack of an adequate information security culture among public authorities, which is crucial for democracy and the digitalization of democracy. So as I said, we still have a long way to go in that fashion. Uh, well, I think that concludes my remarks to give some context about where we stand right now and the directions that we need to head to to make sure that we have a responsible and transparent digitalization in Brazil. And now I will give the floor back to Ana. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you for your time. Nice. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Thank you for your contribution and for having made more clear and less abstract what are the challenges we are facing. It's true that the digitalization of the democratic process pushes our concerns about transparency and security to another level, and it has to be discussed properly. And now I would like to ask Jean, Jean to tell us what are the mechanisms that have been applied and what are the limits and possibilities. Jean, I give you the floor. João. João, we can't hear you. João, I see that oh. you have your mic open, but I cannot hear you. No, we can't hear you. Well, maybe we should pass the floor for Mariana first, and then we come back to João while he's trying to fix it. Can we do like this? Yeah, I think it might be better. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to start here, and then João, you can interrupt me if you manage to, to fix it. Uh, so I think, uh, oh, okay. I'm Mariana, I'm a researcher at IFEHEC, which is the Institute for Research and Law and Technology of Recife. And we are based in Recife, Brazil. And I've been here working with uh, digital rights for a while. I have a legal background. So I think that it might be interesting to bring some impressions on my side in relation to digitalization of our democracy and our rights. I think when we talk about digitalization and it's, it's quite uh, obvious to talk about citizens and participation and how this is going to be in a, in a digital democracy and how this is going to take place in a digital democracy. So I think that we have to be aware of our social scenario and our technological scenario in Brazil before implementing digitalization. As Gustavo said, we have to take a step back and look at, at the current scenario and then we adopt the policies that we might think it's interesting. And when I talk about our current scenario, I want to talk about uh, the huge digital gap that we still face in Brazil. We still have many cities and many places in Brazil who are poorly connected to the internet or who, doesn't, who don't even have connection to the internet. So we have to consider those, those issues of connection and access to information. Uh, even though some people still have connection, 
uh, we also have to think about how they're having that kind of connection. For example, if we have zero rating or not being used, if we have really a full uh, internet use or only a platform internet use, I think it's really relevant to understand how information is it's achieving or its end or everything. Other than that, I think it's important to talk about digital literacy. It doesn't mean that only because we have internet around Brazil, we everyone knows how to use it or everyone knows how to use technology and smartphones and, and tablets and everything and so on. Or even the systems that are being developed, are they really user-friendly? The interface is okay? How is the, this is being developed and how those uh, digital democracy tools are being used or being developed? I think it's an important question to point that. I, I have to warn you, I have more questions than answers. So I'm afraid it's not really, it's not, not really a neat, nice talk that I'm gonna have here, but we are here to debate. Another thing that I want to address, transparency or fairness and the lawfulness of the, the implementation that we're seeing the government taking now. Oh, Jean fixed the, okay, okay, after me, I just saw the chat. Uh, so I think that we have to know how this uh, digitalization is taking place in Brazil. We have a, a lack of public debate. We have not many public hearings that are happening at the moment uh, regarding those digital uh, democracy that they call or the GovTech agenda. And we have um, the agenda is not stopping because of that. We only see uh, governments and cities taking uh, digitalization in order to reduce bureaucracy, for example, and we don't see the, the people knowing or making aware of that. So I think that we have to focus on that too, the transparency of the, the, proce the, the procedures. Or uh, also in how those, those, mm, those procedures are taking place. For example, if we have a public and private partnership, is that partnership made public the contract? Can I see it? Can I have access to how are they dealing with that in the public sector? How they're dealing, for example, with the data from citizens and if they're sharing with the, pri the private sector or not, for what ends? And then that brings me to my third point, which would be the data minimization and the purpose limitation of the use of data in Brazil. We still lack a lot of knowledge or maybe caution how to deal with data. We have a recent uh, data protection law, which has just been enacted and has been in the talk during the last weeks because we finally got it approved and passed. And, and but we still lack the, let's say the best practices in relation to data protection in Brazil. We still lack the, the awareness of we have to collect the minimal amount of data possible for the ends that we need and not do like a, a massive data collection and then we think about what we want the, that data for. No, it's the opposite way. So I think that we, we still lack that. For example, we have the Cadastro Base, which is a decree, highly problematic decree by Jair Bolsonaro that intends to create a huge database with all kinds of data from citizens, from biometric data, what they call biographic data, which we don't even know what's that. And uh, even gate data, they want to collect gate for those who are not really aware of the terms is how you walk. So each person walks in a, in a way that can be recognized. So they want to collect that. We don't know what for. So I think democracy always uh, have to, to deal with this kind of abusive or persecution surveillance when it's threatening. So we have to be careful and to watch that kind of policies that are highly evasive. And to finish my, not to finish, but I think that one of the last points that I want to talk about is how accurate those systems are being implemented are. We have many cases around the world of inaccuracy and of uh, prejudice of systems or what we call discriminatory uses of systems. In the UK now, I think last month, we just saw how automated uh, systems can be problematic and taking decisions in relation to education, for example, who enters in the university and who doesn't. So I think that's really something that we should be aware of. We are, we are using Brazil currently facial recognition in buses and metros and schools in order to access uh, in order to enable access to public services. So that can be highly problematic 
if you're not aware of what kind of uh, algorithms are we using and what kind of uh, accuracy rates we those algorithms have and those systems have. I think it's really, a, especially when we talk about, for example, social benefits and we talk about automated use of technology and social benefits, it's highly complicated. And last, I think Gustavo already told, talked about a little bit, but I think it's security and stability and confidentiality. I think that's one of the main things when we have uh, a digital democracy, we have to be uh, able to ensure that our systems are stable and we use it, oh, strong encryption and that uh, not only we, we have the security, security of our, our communication, which is highly important in a democracy for freedom of speech, for example, but we also have the stability of our systems. We cannot have a system that can be attacked by anyone without encryption. And Brazil is really on a dangerous place. At the moment, we have really problematic bills on wanting to weaken the encryption at the moment. Uh, IPEHEC just produced a study on that and we saw we kind of mapped all the, the bills that were highly uh, problematic in the matter. And we also, uh, with the Crypto Gosto, we saw all the, let's say, we tried to mobilize civil society in order to fight for encryption because it's something that's not being really on the news, but it's, it's in the Supreme Court, for example. We have two lawsuits on the Supreme Court going on in order to decide the future of encryption in Brazil. So I think on my side, that's it. I don't want to take to go further my time. And thank you so much for your attention. And Joel, now it's with you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Mariana, for your contribution. I totally agree with your remark about our gap on digital literacy and digital access. And I think it's important to keep it in mind and it has to be considered when we think about modernizing the public service and digital process, digitalizing the process. Uh, now we can hear João, please. Oh, hi everybody. Yeah. Thank you, hi. Anna. Now I'm, and I, I can speak. <laughs> so at first I would like to thank you all for having this opportunity to talk. And I, are you seeing my screen? No. So I want to thank you all. And as Mariana said, when we talk, when we read the cybersecurity plan for the army, it's like a lot sad because we don't have a strong and concise path to, to strengthen our digital society. And uh, so uh, I'll, would like to say hi to everybody and it's an honor to discuss this how to digitize democracy with you and i will focus my lecture on what we can do what can be done to improve structures of democracy and when we are porting them to the internet so let's begin at first, uh, about me, my name is João Moreno. I'm an electrical engineering student and I research physical electronic voting systems at information security, cryptography, privacy, and transparent laboratory. I am co-founder of a company named Zeta Crypto Transparent Cryptography, where we develop secure and transparent online voting systems. The first thing when we are talking about how to digitalize democracy is what is essential to democracy. And thinking about that, I dissected the democratic process into three phases. The first phase is to give access to everybody who wants to participate at certain decision or discussion. In the second phase, we must create a discussion space to share ideas and at the end, it's important to have a deliberation platform to help decision-making. That's where I enter with online voting. But now I'm going to dive a little bit more about these three key stages. We want to get people together to make politics online. 
as politics are a citizenship matter, we must treat this very carefully because I would like to point out that when changing access to power, we cannot exclude people who were participating already and neither can we make it more difficult for others to participate. And thinking about that, it's important to highlight that we must keep pursuing digital inclusion and always develop platform with accessibility in mind. Going to open discussion, I uh, will talk about this rapidly. I first want to propose a strategy based on Reddit experience. We could have self-moderated space with higher instance to solve disputes. For those who don't know what Reddit is, Reddit is a website based on a lot of subreddits, which are small forum based, uh, which are small forum where people get together to discuss, share, read content. Readers can upvote or downvote content, whether they like or dislike it. I'm focusing on this website because Reddit has three similarities to the system I'm proposing. They have a huge amount of users, like 430 million monthly users. And they have a lot of teams being discussed. They have flexibility to create some rules inside each nuclei. I believe the Reddit success is heavily based on their moderation structure made mainly by volunteers and the flexibility of creating new fora. These two characteristics allow them to discuss what they think is important. This is uh, very good for their structure, but also creates a huge amount of information about certain topics. We must remember that having a huge amount of information available a certain topic can be a problem to democracy. If a group floods some discussion with not important messages, the discussion can even be stopped. Reddit fix it by using an algorithm that evaluates the relevance of certain comments. But this kind of approach could be very harmful for democratic discussions and must be taken into account with a lot of care. Going to deliberation, we cannot speak about online voting systems without speaking about cryptography. The last 30 years were very good for cryptography. Computational power grew exponentially and became available for us. A lot of protocols became feasible to be made at our homes and even at our pockets. I believe that our cell phones and computers are sufficiently secure for being used to vote for minor decisions as invasions are of these devices are becoming more difficult and expensive. And in parallel, we know that cryptography can provide a safe, secure and transparent way of voting. I think all of this, thinking about all of this, we must never forget that when voting on remote devices is almost impossible to fight coercion. But at the end, we have a system that can be used in a lot of scenarios and is robust. Now, our main barrier is making companies implement these protocols, people use and convince governments that cryptography is essential for information society. So in conclusion, I believe we can digitalize parts of our democracy and this can even make it more democratic actually. But I, I know we have a strong enough technical framework, but to make this work, we must build it together. We must be accessible, inclusive and secure by design. To finish, as Reddit taught me, there is no closed solution to create a healthy discussion place and we must empower the groups to take some measures to make the discussion work. Thank you for your time. See you on the internet and the debate. Thank you very much, João, for your pretty interesting contribution. It was very helpful to our conversation. Uh, and and how you has pointed, it can very it can be very useful, but it can't make 
things harder to people to participate and get involved. And I think in talking about digitalizing democracy has much to do, uh, has much to see with the technique questions. And now we can see if we feel have any question in the chat. If anyone has some question, you can put it down. But well, to start, um, I would like to propose one question, question for the panelists. And I would like to ask the panelists, what are the risks of investing in a legislative solutions that focus on ephemeral technologies instead of managing the problem in its complexity? And what is the problem it could bring for anyone who feels comfortable to talk about that? Oh, I, I can go first. Uh, I think it's it's a big deal here because we have the state power and it's actually, uh, it must be stable. When we try to port for some new technology, there is a chance of people not being able to be involved and lost a lot of good quality discussions and actually decrease the capability of political participation. And as, at the same time, if this technology is too ephemeral, it can be changed later. And again, we will have another step excluding more people. I think this is very important to understand and to focus. Like we have this technology, it will last because if it, we don't have sure, we cannot invest so much on it. Go. <laughs> you can go first. Uh, I, I just want to uh, maybe uh, give some examples about uh, what you was talking about. Um, in Brazil, we have the our main internet regulation, the Marco Civil da Internet, which often translates to Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights or something of the sort, is a, a global reference and it's often cited positively, positively. And one of the qualities that is often outlined is that this legislation is neutral with regards to technology. Uh, meaning that it lasts, uh, if we think about uh, uh, how technology was 10 years ago, I, I was talking with uh, uh, some colleagues about this topic just earlier today, and we were uh, talking about how uh, 10 years ago, we basically uh, didn't use our phones to do almost nothing that we do today. Uh, messaging apps were just starting getting big in Brazil, and uh, imagine if we had made the legislation, for instance, assuming that the main technology that would be used for messaging was uh, SMS texts. Uh, it, this would be obviously a huge problem because uh, as we would uh, uh, shift it to WhatsApp and messaging platforms, we would lose uh, uh, the applicability and perhaps uh, the uh, we would lose the efficacy of this legislation. And now we are seeing something precisely like that happening with the famous uh, fake news bill that I mentioned earlier during my presentation. Uh, the bill talks about specifically messaging platforms and uses some terms that are way too uh, particular and it's almost like they're, they're trying to regulate specific companies and specific platforms and this uh, just cannot be a good thing if you uh, consider that we simply don't know what the internet and what our communications are going to look like in uh, five years from now okay uh, i think that um what are the risks there are many authors who talked about the technology solutionism, which is you 
try to resolve everything with technology and even pro problems that are, shouldn't be solved with technology, you, you want to solve them. So social problems, they think that, I don't know, an AI solution, just because they have the buzzword AI or blockchain, there's those buzzwords who are always in the media that tends to solve all the problems and all the, I don't know, all the matters in the world. So I think that when we when we try to be ephemeral and like we, you talked about ephemeral technologies, I think that that's something. And I think this happens because we don't have enough conversation. We don't have enough public debate happening. We don't have, we only have usually the private sector and the government talking. And then we have a bill, a proposal or a decree. We don't have the opinions of the academia or civil society being heard or even the technical community mo most of the times. So I think that this multi-stakeholder approach is one of the answers to, to your question. I think also it's one of the answers to try to reduce the, the level of power asymmetries because if we have solutions made by a field, they're gonna be only uh, functioning for a field. You don't have the, the solution of the problem with just here and to one or two people. I think one of the best uh, regulations that we have in Brazil at the moment were built for years, I think 10 years or so. And then we have a lot of uh, civil society par taking part in discussions and making part of the, the redaction of the law in the Internet Bill of Rights that Gustavo just said, in the, our data protection law, we also have the really huge participation, participation of society. So I think it's, it's inclusion. The answer is like a really, really brief is inclusion. Yes, it meets with the kind of internet that we want to build that is inclusive and with diversity and we need to hear things that are engaged in it. And we have another question in the chat um, and I will read it for you from Natum. First of all, I would like to congratulate all the panelists and despite the digital gap that exclude part of the society that is histor historically forgotten, we have a good case of digital democracy participation that is Mudamos, developed by ITS Rio. Nonetheless, Mudamos face a huge problem that involves the lack of digital digitalization in our legislative system how to encourage the digitalization of our legislative houses, especially in the interiors. I, uh, I can make a quick comment on that. Um, I think uh, with the pandemic, we are seeing a huge boost to the motivation to digitalize. So I think in the coming years, there will be a lot of investment and a lot of enthusiasm regarding digitalization of the of our institutions, uh, broadly speaking. But I think one huge challenge that we face in that arena is that uh, while there is an interest and there is uh, the will to digitalize often, uh, states and uh, cities don't have the same resources as the legislative that is at the national level. So uh, I think that this is uh, one of the reasons for the digital divide that we have uh, in, in Brazil, which is still um, pretty big. Uh, but uh, this is also a reason why we are not seeing, I think, digitalization be... Uh, uh, be more present and it wasn't more present before the pandemic. But my, my guess, and this is really a guess, would be that in the coming years, we will see more of that as uh, the coronavirus changed the perspective on digitalization, I think. I think I don't have much to, to add. I think Gustavo said a lot of, of what I thought too. I know Mudamos, I even, I was a volunteer in Mudamos. I think it's a really nice project. Uh, 
but I still think that uh, this gap that has from the the app to the the chambers or the congress, it's something that we also yeah we have to work on that. I I think that we we would have the answer for the the federal sphere for the national sphere as Gustavo said they have the the resources to go digital. We are seeing this in the during the pandemic. If it's effective. We, we still have to, to ask that because as we, as Gustavo, I think Gustavo said in, in his talk that we are seeing, for example, we, in the fake news bill, we did a kind of a public hearing, a, a sequel de debates, but the, we feel that the, the message was not really, it didn't go through, it did, people really didn't hear us, it was just a, another space occupied, but it seems like our deputies and our senators are not really listening to us. I don't know if this is because of the, the digital means that we are using now or if they would never listen to us anyway. So, but I think that in relation to, you said, especially in the ter interiors, I think it's, it's still related to the digital gap and the digital divide that uh, we are just speaking here. Like we cannot connect if we don't have a connection, a good connection or even digital literacy. We cannot include if we don't have projects that enhance those skills in and build capacities in our population. So we have to address that, I think, before digitalizing our interiors, because otherwise we're going to have just a, a, a tiny, tiny bit of the population taking part in democratic processes. Uh, I think another point is that it lacks interest because when we have these go these governments that are regional they have the power almost centered on, on them and when we create this kind of of platform you open them to the public scrutiny and these in a lot of times are not a uh, very good are not good for for them and i think this lack of of objective for them I, it, it also helps keeping the digitalization as where they are where it is Nice, thank you for answering. And uh, I have another question for you guys. <laughs> and I would like to remember and remark that we are approaching the elections campaign period in Brazil. And it's a very meaningful time for our democracy. And I keep wondering how do you see the risks of possibility and possibilities uh, brought by the context of a strong digitalization and what can be done to make this process as reliable as possible. Okay, I'll go first, <laughs> my time now. Oh, the risks. As always, I think I'm a more pessimist person than optimist, but okay, the risks. Uh, data, data, as I said, is, is, I think for me, it's the highest risk. We have seen across the world the manipulation of democratic processes. So I think that's one of the highest risks when you have digitalization. It's when you don't know what they're doing with your data and who, with whom the government or private companies are sharing your data with and how this can affect a democratic process, even though we think it's quite far away, it's, it's really not. We saw in the Brexit and the US and yeah, everywhere. Uh, but I think it's also, I don't want to be so pessimist or yeah, I'll try to. I think it also gives us a more higher access to information. I think it's, it's an easier access to information and maybe uh, we can mobilize ourselves easier when we have the digital means. 
Uh, for example, there are many platforms who are thinking about diversity and inclusion and representation in our, in our Congress, in other fields too. And we are gathering uh, candidates that are not the white male uh, man, the uh, white old man there. So I think it's, it's important to increase our device, the diversity in our chambers and in our representatives. So I think uh, I want to be optimist and to say that inter the internet and digitalization can enhance that. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I would just, uh, ah, you can go first, Joe. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, well, I, I would like to point out that we are in the informational society and it changes really fast. And the last year with COVID, it changed even faster. So I think it will be actually cr kind of crazy what how can will be impacted in our elections. But I also think that we can try to understand what happened in other countries like New Zealand and India, US, Great Britain, because they passed for a lot of trouble during elections because of the unknown relations in the internet and the online movements. And I think we can learn from, for, from them, even if this kind of speed we moved in the last year is actually unknown. Yeah, I would uh, agree with, with both Mariana and João. And uh, to, just to add a few concerns that uh, I think this information is obviously going to be a big problem. Uh, it was a big problem during the 2018 federal elections and it's probably going to be even bigger this year because while there was some learning uh, especially by the ju uh, electoral judiciary power, which uh, ju the judiciary courts uh, had some learning. They produced some, uh, the experience taught them uh, there was some institutional learning. And uh, um, for instance, they were able to uh, develop a concept of this information that could be used by the courts. And uh, was better than the concept of fake news, which was being employed in a terrible fashion during 2018. Uh, and uh, this information is going to be both a big problem itself and because it tends to bring um, aggressive and often bad uh, solutions in response. So uh, as the fake news bill that we are, uh, I commented a lot during this, during this uh, presentation. I think that uh, we will have to keep an eye out both for the problem of this information and the problem of the uh, quicker and uh, aggressive and often bad reactions that we have to that. And another problem uh, related to data protection is that we still don't have a structure uh, data protection authority in Brazil. Uh, we, we had the, the data protection law just uh, came into force. Uh, but uh, the, and while there was the publication of the decree that creates the structure of the authority, it, the, the institution itself is not yet consolidated. So uh, it will be a big problem because we'll see a high level of judicialization if, if we don't have the data protection authority. And it's extremely unlikely that we will behave, be able to have that articulated by the time of the election. So this is uh, another challenge for us. Thank you very much for your mm -hmm. answers. And we have another question in the chat I will read for you. And it's not re too related to the panel, but do you have any thoughts about Cisco's digital acceleration program that Brazil signed recently?
I, I don't have any thoughts about this particular program, but I think it's worth mentioning that it's important us to understand what is happening and what kind of acceleration they will give us. Because when we are seeing the proposals from Google and Facebook, they were proposing like to connect people to the internet, but actually connecting them to their services. And so at first I would like to see this digital acceleration program from Cisco to know if they are creating a, a true structure for digital acceleration or if they are creating a new market for only for them. Yeah, I would go with with Schwalm. Yeah, more or less in the same line. I just, uh, yeah, I, I I don't know much about it, but I, I'm also always a little bit uh, worried about those highly this this high investments, this high external investments without any kind of counterparts. So I think the program they they invested a lot in brazil and they're not expecting any any kind of return as the media said but we also we know that something in between like in behind the curtains something's going on so i think that's that's the problem of transparency again i think that we we have to to seek more information uh before ad adopting those kind of uh, huge external investments from from foreign companies and from big techs i think yeah that's it Uh, Gustav, do you want to add something? No? Okay. Uh, our time is running out, so I suggest during a round so that you can make uh, your last considerations. One minute, one minute for each. <laughs> Who wants to start? <laughs> uh, I just... Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I just want to thank everyone that watched the panel and say that we we have more questions than answers, uh, as Mariana said, and that we have probably also more challenges than solutions that are ready at this point. But uh, civil society will keep uh, a close eye to things as they develop, and we will be there um, trying to defend human rights and internet governance at this time. That, that's it. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so yeah, I want just want to thank you all for attention and for being not. Uh, I hope I didn't let you down with my pessimism. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your attention. Follow, follow Ipehack, follow Iris, follow uh, Crypt Zeta Crypto. I don't. I... <laughs> Okay, and follow us and follow our work and keep going and keep trying to maintain democracy in Brazil as strong as as once was. And I hope that, yeah, have a nice youth like idea for everyone. I would like to thank you all too and say that let's make democracy better not just as it was before. <laughs> so bye-bye. See you on the internet. Thank you a lot, guys. Uh, just very quickly, now we are having our networking part at the Ciudad de Mexico, Mexico City, uh, Zoom Studio, and then the lunch and the artistic activity. So I hope to see you there. Uh, that's all for now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.